Testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three.
Good morning. Welcome to this fellowship, this service centered around God's word this morning. My name is Dan Wells, worship pastor for these classic services. Glad you are with us. Let's stand together and begin this service with a responsive reading from Psalm 68. O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel, and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people.
wonderful future we have to look forward to. In the meantime, we rest and we lean, depend on the Lord, the rock, our Redeemer. be seated. And let's pray together. Our sovereign Lord, you are the greatest treasure in all the universe. Your word is sweeter than honey. Your character is full of the finest perfections. Your knowledge is unsearchable. Your love is sacrificial and mysterious. Father, we know that your son is the only redeemer, the only founder and the builder of our faith. And Lord, you've in your wisdom made us to be builders too. To build on what you have done for us in Christ is to build wisely on the rock. 
The world is chock full of people building on the sand, which is tragic and sad. All that is being foolishly built is about to be washed away. We confess that on this side of the grave, we are susceptible to that kind of foolish building too. So Lord, we ask that you instruct, protect, and correct us. And at the same time, Lord, we ask that you give us hearts of mercy, that we would be merciful as you are merciful, ready to share our hope and proclaim the joy that you have brought to us in Christ, that many who are perishing would be made alive together with us in Christ. And in all things, God, we, we, we thankfully look to you, the beginning and end of all things. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the orchard. It is just so good to start our day with worship of the Lord, and it just helps to have a choir and orchestra, doesn't it? Uh, that was wonderful. So thank you, Pastor Dan. Well, we do serve a wonderful God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, I'm glad that you're here with us uh, to be together as a church family. And if you are new with us this morning, uh, I would love uh, to uh, invite you to the welcome desk just outside the sanctuary here. We'd love to connect you to the life of our church. Um, we have a gift waiting for you there as well. Uh, and we desire as a church to glorify God by growing in faith, hope, and love through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we believe that God wants every believer to grow in the fullness of maturity of Christ, no matter what your age. And our children's ministry, uh, Orchard Kids, does this every single Sunday. They point our kids to Jesus. Uh, but this summer, we'll have a special event called Orchard Kids Week. Starting June 10th, Orchard Kids Week will be a week-long children's ministry full of worship, games, crafts, and it's all anchored in the gospel. And this is a great opportunity to share with other neighbors or friends or, or family members who have kids uh, to come join during that week-long event. And you can also sign up to volunteer. This is a great way to invest the gospel in the next generation here at the Orchard. You can go to the events page and register for Orchard Kids Week now. And since we're talking summer plans, uh, the Orchard's Family Re Unplugged Retreat at Lake Geneva is happening June 28th through J uh, July 1st. Uh, back by popular demand, this extended weekend is a perfect vacation for families to unplug from the busyness of life to focus on Jesus and each other. Uh, this all-inclusive family camp is designed to be as fun and and as restful as it needs to be. So join me and some other Orchard families uh, for this f summer, uh, summer event. Uh, you can register online before all the spots are taken. And lastly, I hope that you'll be back here tonight for our monthly evening prayer service called Pray First. Uh, of course, we pray as individual Christians, but we're also called to pray as a church together. Uh, prayer realigns our hearts to God, doesn't it? Uh, but praying as a church together re realigns our hearts to God together. It unifies us in prayer. Corporate prayer is an indispensable gift that unifies and empowers the work of Christ in the local church. So this month's Pray First will feature English Next as a Japanese language outreach program. And we'll be praying for our global ministries in the South Asia area and more. So this will be a great hour of uh, worship and prayer and fellowship. So I hope to see you here tonight. Now during this next song, please sign into our online connection card. Uh, this helps us know that you did indeed worship with us. Uh, it's also a great space to share any prayer requests that you have with the pastoral team. We pray for all these prayer requests each and every week. We'd love to pray for you this week as well. You can also use this time to continue in the worship of the Lord through giving. You can do so online or through the app. Or if you brought a physical offering, you can drop those off in the little black boxes outside the sanctuary after the service. And remember, as you give, do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, 
God is pleased.
let's stand together and sing. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Please remain standing now for the reading of God's word and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, and if you are using the church Bible, you'll find that on page 811. If you do not own a Bible, please feel free to take one home as our gift to you. You'll find them located under the seats. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, good morning, church. Let's keep our Bibles open right there at Matthew chapter 6. For the next three weekends, we are jumping back into the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, some of you will know or remember uh, that we began our time in the Sermon on the Mount last summer. And Lord willing, we are hopefully going to finish our time in the Sermon on the Mount this coming summer, uh, but not in the next three weeks. (laughs) 
And this series in the Sermon on the Mount is actually part of a larger series and a longer journey we're taking through the Gospel of Matthew as a whole, and that series is titled The Promise Fulfilled. Um, You know, there's no reason to rush through the Gospels. I'm really glad that in a series here and in a series there, we will take our time as we make our way through uh, this wonderful book of the Bible, Matthew, together. Now, let me briefly remind you, as we uh, reorient ourselves to the Sermon on the Mount, of something that is very important for us to keep in mind as we read uh, this section of Scripture. The Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew 5, verses 1 to 2, which says this, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. So who is Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount? His disciples. And that is really crucial for us to understand. The Sermon on the Mount is not a message about how to become a disciple of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is about how to live once you have become a disciple of Jesus. And that distinction really makes all the difference in the world. Because if you seek to become a disciple of Jesus by trying to live out the Sermon on the Mount as if this is the the path to becoming a Christian, this teaching will crush you. And you'll give up. Now, if you want to become a disciple of Jesus, there's only one way in. Repenting of your sin and believing in him abandoning any sort of self-righteous pursuit of a good enough life because you'll never get there, and trusting in Christ alone. And then, and only then, will you be ready and able to hear this teaching for what it really is, not some standard to meet in order that you might be saved, but instead a calling to pursue Because by God's grace, you have been saved. You see, when Jesus saves you, when Jesus saves you and you become his disciple, he then calls you to trust everything that he says and to obey everything that he commands. That is his calling upon our lives as his disciples. And here's what we've seen so far in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, verses 2 through 12, Jesus teaches us how to find real blessing in those Beatitudes. Then in Matthew 5, verses 13 to 48, Jesus teaches us how to walk in true obedience to God's law. In Matthew 6, 1 to 18, he teaches us how to foster authentic spiritual disciplines. And here's what we'll see over the next three weeks as we listen to these verses in Matthew 6 and into chapter 7. We'll listen as Jesus teaches us how to think about money, anxiety, and judgment. So we have three light and easy topics to cover (laughs) over the next few weekends together. Now, as is always the case, what Jesus says here will challenge us will convict us, but if we have ears to hear, what he says will also encourage us, and what he says will fill us with hope. So here's our focus this morning. As we continue walking through this teaching and the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus want to teach us here about money? This is certainly a relevant topic for us. We live in one of the wealthiest nations in all of human history. We have far more money to manage than most people do elsewhere in the world today. And we all know that in our own individual experience, money can be a source of joy or sorrow. Money can bring us peace or stress. Money can be a blessing to us, and money can be a curse to us as well. It's a difficult topic. So what does Jesus have to say to us? What what wisdom does Jesus have for us when it comes to this very important topic? 
me summarize what Jesus teaches here in three statements. He wants us to invest wisely, pursue contentment, and he wants you and I to devote ourselves to God above all else. Let's take those one at a time. First, when it comes to money, Jesus wants to make sure we invest wisely. Look at Matthew 6, and we pick it up in verse 19, where Jesus says to his disciples, to us, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, Jesus is not saying that it's wrong to have a savings account or a retirement fund or some other investment. And we know that for two reasons, at least two reasons. First, elsewhere, the New Testament actually commends saving as a wise practice. For example, 2 Corinthians 12, 14 mentions parents who wisely and rightly save for their children. So don't read Matthew 6, 19 and close the college savings account or stop contributing grandparents. That's okay. But the second reason we know that Jesus is not just banning all manner of savings here with some blanket statement is because as we look at what he goes on to say, it it becomes very clear that he's not actually nearly as concerned with what's in our bank accounts as much as he's concerned with what's going on in our hearts. That's really what he's after here. And you see that in verse 21 where he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's what Jesus is most concerned with. He does not want our hearts set on earthly treasure. He does not want us looking to our possessions for our peace. He does not want our savings to be our security in this life because the truth is those things are not really all that secure anyway. He says, verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Jesus, speaking in the first century, here is speaking long before our modern banking system. People didn't invest their treasures with J.P. Morgan. Most people kept their treasures hidden inside their homes. And these physical treasures, including hard currency, they were susceptible to all forms of damage and decay. Moths, insects, other vermin could literally chew them up. Rust could come and devour them. And with no security cameras or advanced locks or alarms, thieves could break in and steal them. In Jesus' day, everyone's earthly treasure was vulnerable And it's really not actually different in our day, is it? We just have different sources of vulnerability. We never know when we might face a medical emergency with the the pile of bills that will then follow. We can't anticipate every change in employment, including those that might leave us without the income we expected would be there. We can't foresee the next market collapse or the next war or the next pandemic that would throw our economy into turmoil. The truth is our earthly treasure today is far less secure than we often like to think. As Proverbs 23, 4 to 5 says, Therefore do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. For when your eyes light on it, it is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings flying like an eagle towards heaven. Some of you know that experience. You've watched as your resources sprouted wings, as it were, and just flew away. And could happen when you least expected it. No matter how well you tried to manage what you had, things happen. Our wealth can be very insecure. And ultimately... Ultimately, all of us will lose our earthly treasures when we leave them all behind in death. 
Jesus makes that point in Luke chapter 12, where he's with this crowd that is gathered uh, around him, and he tells them all, take care, take care, and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life, he says, does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he tells them this parable. He says, there was once a very rich man whose land was so fruitful that it produced an abundance of crops. And so here's what the man did. He he tore down all of his existing barns and he built new ones so that he would be able to store this abundance and keep it for himself. And then this man said to himself, when all that work was done, ah, I have everything that I need for many years to come. Now I can relax and eat, and drink, and be merry. But then God speaks to the man, and he tells him, fool, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and these things that you have prepared, whose will they be? In other words, you're going to die tonight? And you can't take any of this with you. And so Jesus then says to that crowd gathered around him, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Friends, our portfolios might become large enough to fill our lives with abundance But if that's all the treasure we have, one day we will not have any treasure at all. So Jesus warns us, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't make earthly treasures your priority. Don't make them your security. Instead, verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Here's the way to invest wisely, Jesus says. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, because what you have in heaven, you will have forever. No one can take it. Nothing can destroy it. But what does that mean? How do we lay up treasure in heaven? Here's a simple way to put it. Just to contrast here, if laying up treasures on earth means the pursuit of temporary riches for the blessings they might bring now, laying up treasures in heaven means the pursuit of eternal riches for the blessings they will bring forever. So how do you pursue eternal riches? Well, first and foremost, you put all your hope and all your security in Jesus Christ, receiving from him the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards you. And then, having received this from him, instead of pursuing wealth as your highest priority, you pursue Christ as your highest priority. You seek to know him more and to love him more and to honor him more in everything that you do. This really is what it means to lay up treasures in heaven. Is it an all-encompassing practice of our lives as we pursue Christ? As John Stott writes, this includes the development of Christ-like character, since he says all we can take with us to heaven is ourselves. It includes the increase of faith and hope and love, all of which abide. It includes growing in the knowledge of Christ, whom one day we shall see face to face, the active endeavor by prayer and witness to introduce others to Christ so that they too may inherit eternal life and the use of our money for Christian causes, which is the only investment whose dividends are everlasting. 
in the life to come, none of us is ever going to wish that we had invested more in earthly treasure and less in heavenly treasure. Because what we invest in heavenly treasure now, we will enjoy forever. Forever. But it's not just a future blessing. There is a present blessing in investing our treasure in heaven as well. Look at verse 21. Again, Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's a warning here. If our treasure is in this world, well, then our hearts are going to be bound to this world. But there's a promise here, too, that if our treasure is in heaven, well, then our hearts are going to be bound to heaven. And in Jesus' day, to, to speak about the heart, we, we think of the heart as almost exclusively having to do with emotions and feelings, and it means that, but it means more than that. To speak of the heart was to speak about the center and the source of our whole inner life with all of its thinking and all of its feeling and all of its volition and will. So here's a very practical application. Here's, here's what Jesus is teaching here. Do you want to set your mind more on Christ and his kingdom? I know I do. I often wish, oh, I wish my thoughts were more towards Christ and his kingdom. You want that? Do you want to increase your affection for your Savior? You want to love him more? Do you want to align your will more fully with God's good purposes? Do you want your heart bound less to earth and more to heaven, well then lay up treasures in heaven. Lay up treasures in heaven. Invest your time, invest your talents, invest your money in Christ's kingdom and watch the effect that has on your heart. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the way to invest wisely. Second, when it comes to money, in these verses, Jesus calls us to pursue contentment. Look at verses 22 and 23. Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, I'll be really honest with you. When I read those verses at the beginning of this week and starting to prepare for this message, I thought to myself, what in the world is Jesus talking about? <laughs> what is he talking about here? Those are actually really fun moments in Bible study. I, I hope you have these because when you, when you feel that way, this is an opportunity where you really get to think, where you really get to dig into the text, and where you also get to benefit from the wise comments of other believers. And after looking at these verses uh, this week, I am convinced that Jesus is talking about contentment. And let me show you why. First, we'll start with, I think, what's the easiest thing here. Just take the illustration. It's simple enough. Picture a room inside of a house with no windows. It's dark inside. Pitch black. But there's a lamp inside of that room. And if the lamp is working properly, when you turn it on, what happens? The whole room fills up with light. In a moment. But if the bulb goes bad and the lamp burns out, even when you flip the switch, even when you turn it on, the darkness in that room remains and it is a deep darkness. That's the illustration. And Jesus is saying, your eye is like that lamp. 
If it's working well, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light, your whole life. But if it's gone bad, if your eye is unhealthy, then your whole body, your your life will be full of darkness. Jesus is saying here, there, there is a way to look at this world that will fill your life with light, and there is also a way to look at this world that will fill your life with darkness. So what is it? What's the healthy way to look at this world he's talking about here? And what's the, what's the bad way to look at this world as well? And again, I, just we could guess from the context and confirm through the context here, but I, I'm just not, not sure the answer is immediately clear in this passage. But here's what helped me. In Matthew chapter 20, so just go a little further in his gospel, Jesus mentions the bad eye again. It's the only other time he mentions it. And what he says in Matthew 20 helps us understand what he means here in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 20, there's another parable. Jesus tells the story of a master of a house who hires laborers to work in his vineyard. And he hires some very early in the morning. He hires others at about 9 a.m., others at noon, others at 3 p.m., and others just before 5 p.m. that day. They all come out at their different times, and they all work in the vineyard, and then evening comes, and the day is done, and the master calls all of those workers together, and he pays all of them the exact same amount of money. And it's not surprising what happens. The people who got there early in the morning, maybe even the 9 a.m. folks, they're frustrated. Because there were some people who showed up just before five and only worked a little bit, and they're getting the same amount that they are. And so these early workers start to grumble. But the master says to them in Matthew 20, 15, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? Now, here's the connection to Matthew 5. That question, do you begrudge my generosity, literally translated reads, is your eye bad toward my generosity? And now we start to see the point. A bad eye, as Jesus uses that phrase, is a jealous eye, a covetous eye, an envious eye. And greedy eye, a person with a bad eye sees the blessings that other people receive and it fills them with bitterness and they begrudge the Lord's generosity to others. Their vision's all cloudy with envy. And as a result, their their life is, is full of darkness full of bitterness, full of grumbling. And Jesus, back in Matthew 5, is calling his disciples and calling us to resist that temptation to look at the world in that way. And that's a real temptation for us, isn't it? I mean, we live in the suburbs where so many people have so much And therefore, no matter what you have, you're always going to be able to look out there and see someone who has something that you want. You'll see their car, or their house, or their marriage, or their family, or their clothes, or their dog, or whatever. You'll see something that you want, and this temptation will come. This temptation to to bitter envy may, may spring up in your heart. You might grumble and say, why hasn't God given that to me? You might complain even and say, why has God given that to them? And you might think they don't even deserve it. And if you embrace that way of looking at the world, it will fill your life with darkness. But there's another way. There's a better way. Listen to Hebrews 13, verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, 
I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is such an important verse. See, the love of money will fill your life with darkness. You'll be bitter, envious, greedy, all these sorts of things. But contentment will fill your life with light. You'll be at peace. And it really is possible. It really is possible when you know Christ. Because you can look at the world. You can look around you, and then you can look at all that you have, and you can find gratitude in your heart, knowing that everything you've got is a gift from him. And at the same time, you can look at the world, you can look around you, and you can look at all that you want and all that you lack and know that the truth is you really have all that you need in him. He's by your side. He cares for you. He'll never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will provide for you now, and he will bring you into the eternal blessings of his heavenly kingdom where you will enjoy the riches of his kindness forever and forever. Brother, sister in Christ, you have all that you need, and you can be content in that. More on that next week. But this is what Jesus is teaching us here about money. Invest wisely. Pursue contentment. And then lastly, devote yourself to God. This is so important. And you'll see the strength of Jesus' statement here in verse 24, where he tells his disciples and tells us, no one... No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, on the first statement, no one can serve two masters, someone might read that and want to push back a little bit and say, really? What do you mean I can't serve two masters? I I do it every week. I've got two jobs. I have two bosses. I have two teachers or more, two different authorities or more over my life. But but that misses the point. Now, Jesus is talking about a kind of service here that involves devotion. He uses that word. Commitment, even love. What he is talking about here is the thing that you live for. The source of your meaning and your purpose, the recipient of your highest affections, the place you rest your deepest hopes, he is talking about your God. Everyone has a God, even atheists, because we all live for something, even if that something is ourselves. And we know this, many people live for money. Money is their Lord dictating their priorities and their decisions and their actions. And they look to money to be their savior, hoping that if they can just get enough that they'll find the peace and they'll find the rest that they want, but it doesn't work. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10 says it well. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money doesn't work. There's a man named Rajat Gupta whose story illustrates this point. Rajat was born in the slums of Calcutta, orphaned as a teenager, and left with nothing. But from there, his life is like the epitome of a rags-to-riches story. By his mid-40s, Rajat had attained incredible success as a businessman and was worth around $100 million. That is more money than most of us can comprehend. As one writer telling his story points out, a 5% annual return on that much money generates almost $600 an hour, 24 hours a day. Rajat did not need any more but he wanted more. He wasn't satisfied with $100 million. 
And his insatiable appetite led him to engage in insider trading with his company, of which he was convicted and imprisoned, tarnishing his career and his reputation. Because he just wanted more. You see, money, like every false god, makes a very cruel master. And therefore, Jesus says, don't serve money. Don't do this. Don't live for money. Don't devote yourself to money. Instead, he says, devote yourself to God, the true God. Look to God as your source of meaning and your purpose. Make God the recipient of your highest affections and the place where you rest your deepest hopes. For in him you actually will find satisfaction. And you will find satisfaction in him because you were made, designed by him to be satisfied in him. As Augustine famously said in his prayer, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. That's true. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. And perhaps you recognize this morning just how restless your heart is. You feel that. Your life is one full of angst, full of dissatisfaction, full of fear, full of uncertainty, full of longings that you just don't know how to fulfill. And perhaps you've even tried to find peace in financial security, or you've tried to find joy in your possessions. You've tried serving money, or you've tried serving something other than God, and you know that it's not working. Well, here's the wonderful invitation for you. Listen to these words from Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, he says. With all your laboring, with all your burdens, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will. He will. Come to him. Confess that he is Lord. Let him dictate your priorities and your decisions and your actions. Trust that he's your savior. Believe the good news that he died to forgive all your misplaced devotion, all your sin. And believe that he rose to secure the riches of everlasting life for you and that he will provide for you, that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you until you are safely home with him. Come to him and rest. Devote yourself to God. This is what Jesus wants to teach us about money in Matthew 6, 19 to 24. He calls us to invest wisely, not to be so concerned with laying up treasures here on earth which are temporary at best, but instead to lay up treasures in heaven which we will enjoy forever. And he calls us to pursue contentment, and it is a pursuit. We have to go after this. We don't just find it perfectly forever. We, we, we run after this by God's grace, and we do this by recognizing and acknowledging the ways in which envy and greed will darken our whole existence, if that's the way we want to look at this world. And instead, seeking then to walk in the light of gratitude for all that God has given us and all that we trust he will provide. And above all else, Jesus calls us to devote ourselves to God because we cannot serve God and money. We cannot serve God and anything. It's all or nothing. We either look to Christ as Lord or we will look elsewhere. We either trust in Christ as Savior or we will trust something else. But friends, here's the truth that I know so many of us believe and I pray everyone in this room will believe. There is salvation in no one else other than Jesus. 
There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Come to him. Let's pray. Find rest, my soul, in God alone. Amid the world's temptation. When evil seeks to take a hold, I'll cling to my salvation. Though riches come and riches go, don't set your heart upon them. The fields of hope in which I sow are harvested in heaven. Father, we pray that you would help us to say these things honestly, that we might find rest for our souls in you alone, in Christ alone, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to resist the real temptation it is for us to set our hope, to seek our joy, and to look for our security in the things of this world. God, you have given us many good gifts to enjoy, and we want to receive them and steward them with gratitude. We want to be people who are generous with what you have given to us, investing well the resources that you have entrusted, but we don't want to look to any of them as our hope and as our God. So we pray that you would help us to look to you, to look to Christ, our Lord and our Savior, to devote ourselves to you more fully, more completely, for our joy and our good, and for the glory of your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand, please. Take my We have the joy of coming around the Lord's table now and remembering uh, the ultimate reason 
why we would devote ourselves to Christ uh, as we reflect and rejoice on his level of devotion to us. I think fittingly consider this description of what Christ did for us in his death in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, which says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Christ left the eternal glories of heaven and came to earth. He laid down everything, including his very life on the cross, that we might know the riches of his grace and kindness to us. That's what we remember every time we come around the Lord's table and we think of his body given for us and his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins, for the hope of everlasting life, and we know that he rose and is a living Savior, caring for us and ready to receive us into his presence one day. And so as we participate in this meal together, it's a meal for all who have trusted in Christ. If that's you, we invite you to join with us. And parents, we trust you to know when your kids are ready to receive the bread and the cup. But let's give thanks to God for the riches of his grace in Christ in our hearts as some music is played. And then Pastor Greg will lead us in taking the bread and the cup all together. When Jesus had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you please stand? Church, go with these words from Isaiah 58. And may the Lord guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail and you go in peace Mm -hmm.